Hello, my name's Ajay Ryan, and you're watching The Defining Moment for Creating the Culture of Conscience. Today, it's a pleasure for us to welcome back Lord Tarsim King. Before becoming a member of the House of Lords, Lord King was a school teacher for more than 23 years. He joins us today to talk about why does education in schools not work? Lord King, thank you for joining us again on The Defining Moment. Yeah, thank you for inviting me and uh, let me have my thoughts shared by your listeners. Well, we welcome this opportunity to, to get your insights on the topic today, education in schools, and, and why you think it doesn't work. Before we do get into that, can you please tell us about your own defining moments as a school teacher in those 23 years? Yeah, I think I have seen a lot of changes uh, since I came into uh, teaching. Uh, because at that time, when I joined my first school, which was in 1968, uh, there were very few people from uh, so-called uh, overseas people or people from ethnic minorities. Uh, and it was very, very difficult to get into, into teaching itself. Uh, not from uh, people's point of view, even staff point of view. I remember on, on my first day in school, uh, because I was appointed and the head of the department was not very keen, and the head teacher was. So on my first day, I was uh, given a register to Mark and say, this is your room number. Nobody went with me to the room number, so I have to actually introduce myself to, to the people. But at that time, I think people were still very uh, receptive of, uh, of, of teachers. Uh, so there was not much problem from that point of view. But that has changed over the years. And uh, teaching has become a very, very difficult job these days. And that's actually the, the crux of today's topic is, uh, is the, the reasons why you feel it's not working today, perhaps not so much to do with the teaching, but to do with the behavior in class. So how, how did you experience that yourself? Because I, I remember in my teaching uh, training days, uh, we were told that if you want something done, you ask your people, will you please do it uh, for me? Uh, and uh, that was about it. But uh, as the time went by, you ask uh, in your class, will you do it for me? And you will get an answer, no. Uh, so it was a quite different thing. So you have to find new ways of actually talking to people because uh, respect for teaching profession has been declining, not from pupils' point of view, from parents and also from a lot of politicians as well. And I think that is a major reason uh, the education system is not performing as well as it should. Now, in those 23 years, were there turning points? I mean, coming into the late 1960s and then going into the 70s, the way that, I guess, society was changing, culture was changing, uh, coming out of that hippie generation and... Uh, were there turning points that you, you actually could see as a teacher in class, suddenly everything has changed? It hasn't changed all, just suddenly. It has gone, gone over, over the years uh, we, because uh, respect for authority has declined over the years and it is going down almost every year since then. So you, you didn't recognize like a tipping point at, at some point that because of what was happening in, in society that uh, the behavior, the standards in schools started to drop? Uh, yeah, I can see when they start to drop, uh, but not they haven't dropped suddenly. They have come over the years. Uh, and, when, and when do you think they actually did start? Because you said in, in 1968 you felt you were treated with respect. And at what point did you feel the respect suddenly went out the window? Uh, it, it happened when we start getting a full employment, people can get a job without being taught by anybody. Uh, so people thought, why to get education? So respect for education uh, gone down quite a lot. And it was true as well, because when, when there was full employment, for example, in the West Midland, we got so many factories and uh, foundries uh, that you can get out of school, and people were very keen to get out of school, not to get education. You get a job and you will be paid more than your teachers were. So there was no incentive. And I think uh, one reason for decline was lack of incentive for pupils and teachers at the same time as well. 
Uh, can you tell us about the, the perspective from teachers? Why was there a lack of incentive for the teachers? Uh, because salaries were quite low, if you compare to other professions. Uh, and uh, people who become teacher were really going there through idealism because they want to contribute something to the society. Uh, but salaries, if you compare to other people, were very, very low. And do you think that that's improved, that situation has improved? Over yeah, the it years? has improved quite a lot uh, in recent years especially. Uh, but uh, I, I think then it creates some other problems as well, uh, which some of them are a really lack of interest by parents, for example, in, in the education of their children. And it is constant uh, interference uh, by politicians as well, I'm afraid, which is uh, not really helping the situation. Well, Lord King, over the last few years, the government has put a lot of emphasis on recruiting teachers into the profession, and they've used the slogan, you never forget a good teacher. So obviously there is the potential to have a special relationship, but then why is it that that is not always the case? Why, why are children choosing not to go to school or to, to be truant and even to leave school altogether? Because I think it is general lack of respect for education. Uh, because uh, we have technology changing very, very fast. And uh, if you don't keep up with the technology, it is going to be very, very difficult to compete. And I think it is much easier for uh, parents if they're unemployed or uh, things like this. They don't put as much emphasis on education as it used to be. Uh, because to me, if you want to learn from somebody, you can't do it without respecting that person. And I think that's mis missing in this country. Uh, and until people learn to respect one another, because these days I think a uh, general uh, situation is that people feel that teachers are paid. Uh, kids will say, you are paid for it, isn't it? Uh, and uh, you can't learn anything uh, from a person by just uh, thinking that he's paid for it, so he must uh, teach you this or teach you that. You have to have receptive mind, and that's not there. But often it's said that respect has to be earned, and do you think teachers are actually earning respect? I think there is a fault on both sides, on teacher side as well, uh, because if uh, there are some trendy teachers these days... Uh, well, what do you mean by trendy teachers? They, they will just go with the uh, uh, youth culture sometimes, which is not really very a good culture. Because Try to be part of the, the young crowd. The young crowd and uh, uh, behave like them when they are with them. And uh, obviously then they can't uh, actually expect uh, to be respected. And do you, do you think that, that then creates an obstacle because it takes away a positional relationship where you're no longer a teacher but you're just a friend? Do you think? Do you see that as a problem? Not even friend. I think you have to be a friend when, uh, uh, to be an effective teacher. Uh, but they're not friends. They, they try to become part of the crowd uh, and behave exactly the same way, which uh, fortunately is not too many teachers who are doing that, but it is happening. And, and in, in terms of just gaining respect, because like, that's obviously a key word, is it really in our culture here in the UK to respect? I mean, respecting teachers, respecting parents, respecting elders, is it not the case that that's actually an issue in, in all those areas? I think it is. I, I think it is both for family life and uh, I think most of the things start from your family life. Uh, you've got now television blaring away all the time. Uh, parents will just go out and come home. Uh, when I say that, I'm not talking about all the parents, but a uh, lot of parents, especially in uh, difficult areas, uh, just go and play sometimes bingo and uh, don't talk to their children. They have no time for their children. And uh, children are left to their own devices. Uh, and uh, the time they use is not really productive to get education. So where, where does respect begin or the education of respect begin? It, it should uh, begin from home. And then all the other uh, organization who are dealing with the education, they should reinforce that uh, uh, culture of respect, which is not there now. 
So, in other words, for teachers, they're already dealing with a situation that's that's backwards because if their respect is not there at home, when they, when those pupils come to the classroom, they 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 don't have a mentality in which they can even. Uh, have the sensibility to feel oh, I should respect my teacher because they don't even respect their parents. No, that, that, that's a major problem. And it could be that uh, obviously they, they get enough you know, money for their uh, pocket money and uh, that sort of situation. And they don't feel that they have to respect anybody. But do you think this is like a, a working class issue? Because often you see also uh, children from well-to-do families, you could say quite sa stable families, and, and, and those children also seem to be going off the railings, I mean, especially if it comes to, to getting into drug culture or, or into, into uh, just general promiscuity. Um, it seems like also they, they're not always the model kids, the ones who have uh, well-to-do families, rather than the ones who are going to bingo, but perhaps the ones who are going to opera, they're also not doing perhaps the best job of bringing up their, their children. Because to have everything also create problems as well. In well-to-do families, people got enough money to give money to their children. And with money, you can't really sort of say to kids, it is better to get education because they got enough money. And they try to just uh, shut up in a way their kids by paying them money without actually talking to them and uh, talking to them about what is the life all about and and I think until that comes back it is very very difficult to erase standards. So on the one hand we have teachers dealing with pupils and we have parents dealing with children uh, and both of them seem to be at a loss how to how to take things forward how to really I mean, not just to go back to the 1960s, because there is always a tendency to think about a golden, a golden age or golden generation, and it's it's unbelievable as it may seem. Perhaps 20 years from now, people will look back at today and say, "Oh, this was such a, a great time. Kids were so well behaved." Because it might be the case that things will just get worse. So, w where do we start in terms of finding solutions? I, I think the basic thing you have to start is uh, really somehow to bring back some values as you were talking about principles and values. And until you reinforce those uh, through stable family life, talking to kids, uh, then it is, it is very, very difficult to change these. And that's not happening at all in, in society these days. Uh, because kids feel, you see, our parents have produced us. Uh, not, not for anything else, it was just for their own pleasure or something like that. And uh, they have nothing else to do with us. And parents sometimes feel the same. Uh, and fortunately there are some parents who uh, are good. Uh, but on, on the whole, sometimes pa parents say, right, uh, it is teacher's job to look after the children, which is not the case. It is parents' job as well. It is everybody's job and it is job of the society as well to create climate where manners and principles are part of education. I think that's a very good point because, as you said, children need to feel value. And if they feel their value, as in the example you gave, comes from just a, a Friday night fling, yeah. and that's, that's where they kind of get their value from or they perceive their value. Um, how, how do we go about giving a sense of value or giving a sense of um, that young people themselves can actually look at their situation and, and, and see opportunity, see hope, and actually see themselves with having value. How do we go about establishing that? I think the only, only thing we can do is really through education to create awareness. And that's not a slow, and that's not a very fast process. It, it takes time. But education in schools? Uh, no, education generally, education about life from both parents, from society, uh, people around the children as well. And they should have some sort of uh, a target, isn't it, to, that they, they are there to achieve. But at the moment, there are no targets, it, it seems. It is free for all. And that's not creating conducive situation to learn. You mentioned earlier, Lord King, that uh, there was a time, and I'm sure there is still the case today, that teachers came into the profession with idealism. 
a sense of being able to to nurture and raise up the future leaders of our world and uh, to, to play that role and, and I, of course there is a, a, a lot of uh, job satisfaction if you want to call it just that in, in being a part of nurturing uh, young minds. Now that sense of idealism, do, do you think that it really does still exist today or has it just now disappeared? Because I think it would be very difficult to take on a huge responsibility like the one we face unless you do have a sense of vision and, and passion. Otherwise, it's just a job and then you can leave it when you go home at 3.30. I think when people come into teaching profession, they have a passion then. Uh, but there are so many things against them that that passion seems to evaporate very, very quickly. Now, what, what is against them? Uh, everything that children will come and simply say, you are paid, so uh, you are really nobody, you are our paid servant, for example. Uh, and when you hear things like that, uh, in, in the past, uh, when, when we, we start in teaching, we used to say, uh, our children, this child was from our school, and they have pride in their children, and children have pride in their school. That's no longer there now. And I think somehow we have to create climates to bring back that pride, uh, not only in schools and in their teachers, in their community and in themselves, which is most important. And often we, we watch movies where we will see a teacher go into a, a, a run-down, comprehensive school, a kind of ghetto school, and take on the challenge of you know, a class and, and raise up that class. And, and in the end, obviously, there's a, a happy ending. Um, so th that's an example of how that idealism and that passion can, in the end, come through and, and success can be achieved. But you said that it's the, the, the pupils that often become a barrier because of their cynicism, their attitudes, their general lack of behavior or good behavior. But what about the institutions themselves? Are, are, are the school systems or the governing bodies, the, the way that schools are run, is that supporting teachers to accomplish those kinds of, th that, that kind of dream? I, I think governing bodies have a role to play very important role to play. Uh, but if area is a bit run-down area, then you don't get parents volunteering themselves to become member of the governing body, for example. Uh, because uh, if you look on principle, people say uh, parents should take part in the running of their schools, which is all right if the parents are well-educated and uh, they got enough time to come and serve their schools. But that's not happening in rundown areas. So it is a multiplier factor, isn't it? In those rundown schools, it becomes even worse. Uh, so we have to somehow uh, actually arrest that decline. Uh, and, and that's not happening because sometimes people say it is a lack of uh, money or uh, resources. Uh, which I, I know sources are very, very important. Uh, but I think people tend to blame other things other than uh, the pupils, isn't it? If anything goes wrong, it must be in the, due to family problems. And if you look on countries like India, for example, uh, sources are not there, uh, poverty is there, uh, but uh, children are still doing quite well in, in most cases. Uh, so that can't be the only reason. And I think it is a lack of ideals uh, to put in front of children to make sure that they actually work hard to achieve something for themselves and for their community. And that pride is uh, uh, not there, and we have to somehow restore that pride. Well, you mentioned India. I mean, could you expand on, on those ideals? Because uh, like most things, I mean, we can obviously learn from others. And, and what is it about countries like India and, and I'm sure others where the school system seems to actually work? At least there is a sense of, is it just discipline? Because I, I know hearing from my own parents that when they were at school, they, they were disciplined. I mean, they were actually slapped or they were made to sit in the corner and, and, uh, and, and in a sense suffer in order that they came to the point of realization that they're not meant to be naughty and uh, well, at least in class they, they should behave and, uh, and attend the teacher. 
No, so do, in that sense, do, do you think we should bring back that kind of discipline into our schools? Yeah, I, I'm not in favor of corporal punishment, for example. But there should be other ways in the 21st century to bring that pride back, uh, which, as I said, is not happening. And people are better off relatively in countries like this. And they don't value education as people in India do. For example, when I was at school, we used to travel about uh, 10 miles on foot to school. And there was no question of misbehaving then, because by the time you get to school, you were tired enough to just listen to the teachers, what they say, and uh, uh, try to learn as much as you possibly can, because uh, that was the thing to do. But not anymore in countries like these. Lord King, you mentioned India, and of course there's a completely different culture there and a, a different set of circumstances which obviously motivates younger people to, to want to go to education, to achieve an education. And of, that, that's different here, you've already established that. But how can we develop not just uh, the relationship between teachers and parents, but how can we collectively even start to change the culture so that there is a respect for teachers, there is a respect for parents. Otherwise, if you're the only one doing it and the rest of the class is misbehaving, you will either join the gang or you will be the odd one out. And we all know what it means to be the odd one out. Yeah, I think we should reinforce that uh, discipline uh, somehow. And uh, I think at the, at the moment, uh, obviously there is a difficulty from parents uh, if they don't talk to their children. And I think media seems to be doing more damage, uh, unintentionally it may be, uh, because people learn quite a lot from the media. And media has a responsibility, which I think is uh, not taken on board yet. And uh, that's going to be very, very important in the future. Uh, because media is so powerful these days. It can influence children. And if they sort of uh, uh, show you programs like Grange Road and <laughs> Uh, things like that. That does more damage than even parents do. Uh, so we have to have a responsible media as well. Because well, be, Being a politician, obviously you have a dual role. I mean, at least during that time you were both a teacher and in politics. <clears throat> you, you, you had that dual role as someone who's an insider, can see the situation, and at the same time in a position to actually do something about it on the level of society or in your constituency. And I suppose that's what I'm getting at. So do you think, I mean, media certainly has a role to play, but what about politicians? Are they supporting that development of uh, a culture in which education can, can work? Yeah, I think at the moment, uh, obviously, they are not doing it. Otherwise, it won't be, we won't be in that situation. But there were reasons for that when, when I was a teacher, uh, because we gone through very, very difficult time in local government then. Uh, there was cuts everywhere uh, from up to 1979. Then we started getting some uh, respect back. Uh, you got buildings which was uh, uh, falling apart uh, and there were no materials and uh, that created its own problems. So budgets uh, were cut in the late 70s? Oh yeah, quite, not, not minor amounts, yeah. almost. Uh, it was non-existing because I was chair of education for number of years. Every year you go to teachers um, when you get get together annually. Uh, and your agenda used to be uh, where we can do the cutting. <laughs> and that's not very sort of respectful because if you look on education, that should be the main provider of knowledge and future generation skills. And, and that was being cut so badly that it dissipated almost uh, education completely in, in during those years. And what about, I mean, of course, nowadays it's all education, education, education. It's on the, <clears throat> on the front page of everyone's policy. But are, are, are these initiatives, for example, like Ofsted, you know, the government inspectors come into schools, are, are initiatives like that making a difference or are they just getting in the way? I think there's a lot of money coming into schools now. Uh, but uh, what we have to really see is, uh, is that money used effectively? And I think that comes to the idealism of teachers and uh, profession uh, by backing from the parents and, and, 
uh, and the local authority and the central government as well. Uh, so we have to do it all those things together rather than uh, one one thing pu pushing and pulling in other other direction, and that's not going to be helpful at all. So finally, how do we make education in schools work? We've, we've talked about respect. You mentioned also pride. We've looked at the role of politics, that they also need to take a hand. Parents and teachers need to work together. So those are all aspects of a solution. But it, from your experience as a teacher, how do you think we're going to turn this around? I think we should let education in the hands of experts who know about education and let it settle down so that we don't change almost every year different uh, syllabuses and uh, a different way of teaching and I think leave it to the professionals and then ask for their output. Because if you keep on interfering, then you are responsible for running it. So are you saying that the people who are running it now are not professionals? They're not the experts? Uh, they're, uh, those people who are experts, they are not allowed to run the system. It is so many changes and so many interference from every angle now. That is making life very, very difficult to be in teaching profession. When teachers are not settled, then people can't be settled either, can they? So there's no consistency? No consistency at all. And no stability? That's, that's, that's the problem. I think you have to have stability so that people know where they stand. At the moment it is changing from year to year and even within the year. And uh, that's uh, not creating a stable situation either for teachers or for parents or for uh, pupils either. So until that's sorted out, yeah. young people are still going to deteriorate into, into more and more, uh, well, disillusionment. Yeah, I'm not saying, you see, that change shouldn't come, but change shouldn't come that frequently, that uh, whatever changes you bring, you don't find uh, their effect before you bring another change in, and that's making life very, very difficult for everyone. And the partnership between parents and teachers, do you see that relationship becoming stronger? Yeah, I, I think that has to come. Uh, otherwise, you see, if you just put resources in and then everyone doing their own thing is not going to be. And I think we should realize as a country that children are our future. We must work together, pull in the same direction uh, so that we can educate them which is good for them, good for their parents, and good for the country as a whole. Until we do that, uh, and as I said, the media has a big role to play in that, and I hope they come up with uh, their two-penny birth into the system as well. well do, so you, do, you have any, do you have any tips, directions for the media, what they should be doing? It not? is very, very difficult to, for media. I can't can see that because... Mm -hmm. uh, uh, they, they try to bring programs which people want to watch and if, if they start preaching uh, then people will turn the televisions off and uh, I, I think somehow we have to create a situation that uh, people listen to the media, listen to uh, their elders and uh, things like this which I know is uh, old fashioned ideas uh, but until we all pull together, uh, education will suffer. And if education suffers, then everything suffers as a whole for the country. Lord King, thank you very much for coming on The Defining Moment today. Thank you for inviting me. You've been watching The Defining Moment for creating the culture of conscience. If you'd like to see more of our shows, we're on the web at www.definingmoment.eu. Thank you for watching and we wish you all the best.